Hey there, family. I am Pastor Jeremy, and I'm so glad you joined us for our lecture today. Let's jump right in as usual. Um, do you know how many Methodists there are in the world today? I mean, uh, when John Wesley died in 1791, there were approximately 115,449. So we got off to a pretty good start in his lifetime. But today, we can say that as United Methodists, we are more than 12 million members strong across the globe. That's 12 million people called towards the work of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's 12 million people who have been impacted by the unique way that John Wesley did church and Christian spirituality and who have been sent out to impact the lives of others as well in real ways. And I'm not sure if you know this, but making sure that we have this impact in the world has been a part of who we are as Methodists since the very beginning. Wesley famously said, uh, the gospel of Christ knows no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Faith working by love is the length and breadth and depth and height of Christian perfection. Simply put, uh, the gospel necessitates our connection and caring for others. As a matter of fact, uh, the idea that we do faith together and that we do the greatest good in the world when we do faith together uh, is so important to us that we have what's called a connectional polity in the UMC. Polity is really any governing structure, but by connectional, I mean to say that every church and ministry within the United Methodist Church is connected. The Book of Discipline, which I'm sure you just know or remember from a few weeks ago, describes our connectional polity as enabling us to carry out our mission of making disciples of Jesus for the transformation of the world with unity and strength. One example of this emphasis on uh, pulling our collective efforts and talents together as a faith community uh, to help others actually involves the United Nations, the Gates Foundation, and the NBA. That's right, Michael Jordan's NBA. In 2006, uh, when the United Nations and the Gates Foundation decided to pull their efforts to address the problem of malaria in Cote d'Ivoire, which you may know as the Ivory Coast, uh, they began to survey the area and were surprised to find United Methodists uh, present everywhere they hoped to serve. So they decided to bring the UMC in as founding partners of an organization called Nothing But Net, uh, Nothing But Nets, which raised $7.5 million in three years to provide families with insecticide-treated bed nets. Uh, they also brought in the NBA because how could they miss the opportunity to include the NBA with such a name as uh, Nothing But Nets? This effort was so successful that the organization branched out to providing medications, helping with hospital infrastructure, educating communities on malaria, and other preventative measures. They eventually formed a whole new organization that specialized in those things called Imagine No Malaria. Uh, over the years, our collective efforts as a local, national, and global community of faith have helped countless people. And in our text this week, we'll explore where we see such a call to bear good fruit in Scripture. Today, we'll be jumping into the 13th chapter of Luke as we continue our journey through the gospel and continue our Rekindle sermon series where we spark again the fires that inspired us to walk the Wesleyan way and become United Methodists. As I said, we'll be in the 13th chapter of Luke, specifically verses 1 through 17. Let's start by reading verses 1 through 9 together. Some who were present on that occasion told Jesus about the Galileans, who Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices. He replied, Do you think the suffering of these Galileans proves that they were more sinful than other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you change your hearts, and your lives, you'll die just as they did. What about those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were more guilty of wrongdoing than everyone else who lives in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you change your hearts and your lives, you will die just as they did. Jesus told this parable. A man owned a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. He said to his gardener, look, I've come looking for fruit on this tree for the past three years, and I've never found any. Cut it now. Why should it continue to plead in the nutrient soil? The gardener responded, Lord, give it one more year, and I will dig around it and give it fertilizer. Maybe it will produce fruit next year. If not, then you can cut it down. To me, this passage makes more sense uh, when you read it knowing that the chapter preceding it starts with uh, Jesus warning his disciples to watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees, which was the gap between these, religi these religious leaders' lives and their hearts, between what they said and what they did. 
Uh, he also seems to suggest that they were in physical danger when he tells them not to fear those who can kill the body, but the one uh, who can punish them even after death. Uh, we open chapter 13 with Jesus speaking to a crowd when someone reports that Pilate, the Roman governor over the province of Judea, uh, had a group of Galileans killed while they were offering sacrifices. This is pretty shocking news. I mean, these were Jewish people killed in the midst of one of their most intimate and sacred acts of faith. The implications are far reaching. Jesus, however, sees this as a teachable moment to talk about the coming judgment. He asks in parallel questions about this tragedy, but also about one that happened in Salome, uh, which is in southern Jerusalem. He asks them uh, if the Galileans who died by Pilate's order or those who died in Salome were sinners than the people who didn't die. The answer to both of these questions is, of course not. But Jesus plays off the popular notion that uh, misfortune is always the result of sin. However, uh, Jesus tells them that if they didn't change their ways and repent, they would perish just as the great, just as those who uh, were killed in the great calamities did. Uh, death here is a metaphor for the coming judgment. Just as uh, death, just like death, uh, judgment was imminent and unpredictable. So the need for repentance was urgent. To tie all this together and be clear, uh, when tragedy strikes, it's not God's doing to punish sin. Uh, however, we should receive the unpredictable nature of death uh, as a cause to be vigilant for the coming judgment and to be about the business of doing what we're called to do. Next, Jesus presents a parable about a fig tree. In short, a man who owns a vineyard uh, wanted a, tr a fig tree that didn't produce any fruit cut down. Uh, the gardener bids him to give it one more year, and if it still didn't produce any fruit, then he could cut it down. This continues Jesus' theme of warning about the coming judgment. How close did this tree come to seeing the end of its life because it was found not doing what it's supposed to do when the owner of the vineyard came? Uh, though, it not, though it had not produced fruit for three years, uh, this day in particular was the day the owner decided he wanted it cut down. The judgment Jesus was warning them about will come just as swiftly. Stories about unfruitful trees were actually pretty common in ancient Near Eastern religious and wisdom literature. Usually, these stories ended with the tree being destroyed because of its fruitlessness. Jesus' parable, however, uh, concludes with the gardener coming to the tree's defense and saving it for one more year. Uh, when we take into consideration the importance of land and livestock for the average person at this time, this imagery becomes even more potent. If this tree uh, that wouldn't produce any fruit was allowed to remain, it would occupy space that a tree that actually would produce fruit could take up. Less space for actually fruitful trees meant less food to eat or sell. Uh, it was in the way. This could be a potent warning to us as the church. We want to be productive in accomplishing the mission of spreading God's love, not in the way. Um, in the Old Testament, the fig tree and the vineyard were common symbolism for Israel. Considering this, we see Jesus ushering a warning to the people of God to change their ways and repent, uh, lest they find themselves in danger of being cut down. Thinking back to the beginning of our time together in our Wesleyan heritage, this text admonishes us to do all we can to make sure that we're living into our call as United Methodists to be fruitful and living out our mission and impacting the lives of others. Now, let's look at verses 10 through 17. Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. A woman was there who had been disabled by spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and couldn't stand up straight. When he saw her, uh, Jesus called her to him and said, Woman, you are set free from your sickness. He placed his hand on her, and she straightened up at once and praised God. The synagogue leader, uh, incensed that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded, There are six days during which work is permitted. Come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord replied, Hypocrites. Don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from his stall and lead it out to get a drink? Uh, this isn't, uh, it, then isn't it necessary that this woman, a daughter of Abraham, bound by Satan for 18 long years, be set free from her bondage on the Sabbath? When he said these things, all his opponents were put to shame, but all those in the crowd rejoiced at the extraordinary things that were done. We've seen all throughout the Gospel of Luke that uh, the Gospel writer typically follows a story about a man with a story about a woman. Uh, this theme continues here in chapter 13. Uh, Jesus follows this story of the close call of the fig tree at the hands of his master with the story of a woman who was afflicted in a way uh, that she had been unable to stand up straight for 18 years. Though this story parallels the story of a man in chapter 14 more closely. 
Uh, anyhow, uh, Jesus was teaching on the Sabbath at one of the synagogues, and he spots this woman and immediately heals her. I think it's notable here to mention that he did not tell her that her sins were forgiven. He continues to distance life's misfortunes from a person standing with God or wrongdoings, uh, as he did when he asked if the Galileans in the previous verses uh, met their fate because of their sin. Notice here the difference between the reaction of the woman and the leader of the synagogue. Having been healed, she immediately begins to praise God, which we know is a typical response to prophecy or the work of God in the Gospel of Luke. However, uh, the synagogue leader becomes indignant and begins to complain that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath and talk about how there are six other days in the week for that. Um, people come, people should come and be healed on those days, he said. Jesus' response about how a person would untie their ox to water it even on the Sabbath is masterful because it forces them to acknowledge her humanity. He basically says, if you would care for an animal on this day, how much more is it your responsibility to care for another human being on the Sabbath? The text tells us that after he says this, that uh, everyone who opposed him on the matter was put to shame. They should have been. Part of our call as United Methodists is to recenter the humanity of those who have been oppressed and cast aside. In the same way that Jesus puts the needs of this woman ahead of religious laws and tradition, we are called to prioritize the needs of, the needs of those around us, despite the social and cultural norms of our context. In our book, Faithful Friendships, Donna Roberts talks about how we see our Wesleyan forebears live into this call when she writes about the Strangers, the, the strangers Friends Society. Uh, the, uh, these were groups formed by close associates of John Wesley in the late 1870s who went to the sick and poor in industrial cities and cared for them until they were able to get back on their feet. These were individuals who had no prior connection to these societies and were, were mostly alone in the world without anyone to care for them. These societies did the same thing Jesus did when he called that woman a daughter of Abraham in the midst of all those claiming in essence that she, was, she should have to wait for a healing because it was the Sabbath. What they did was they recentered the humanity of the downcast. That's the work of the church, to make sure that our connection uh, is the most powerful force it possibly, it possibly can be in returning people to dignity while showing them the love of God.